guys, we are here at Amoeba Music in Hollywood, my favorite store ever, and they've given me behind the scenes access to talk to one of their vinyl buyer pricers about what goes on here. Check it out. All right, guys, we have an awesome video today. I am here with Pete Majors. He is a vinyl buyer pricer at my favorite record store, Amoeba Music. First of all, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate that. First thing I want to know is how did you get into this line of work? Uh, definitely love of music. Always wanted to work in a record store. I think when I was younger, it seemed like it was hard to do. Mm -hmm. Shopping, uh, little mom and pop stores, and a lot at like maybe Tower Records, and thinking that those people were probably too cool and I could never be. <laughs> that cool guy, uh, but when I was a junior in college uh, up north, uh, San Jose State, I started working for Rasputin Music. Oh, nice. Uh, and that was my introduction, just solely through loving music. That's awesome, yeah. I feel like you watch movies like High Fidelity and you're like, oh man, like how do I be that guy? <laughs> but then you become that guy and you're like, awesome, I'm not I'm not, you know, as annoying as they are, I'm trying to be my own person and that's great. <laughs> why do you love vinyl? I mean, I know why I love vinyl, but I always love to hear other like fanatics and like their reasoning for why that's the medium of choice for them. Well, I, I mean, when I was growing up, I had records as a kid, yeah. and then my generation was more cassettes. When I was about 19 or 20, and then you know, right when I started working in record stores and being around people who did embrace it as a format, it was kind of like, why? Like, why is this kind of like seemingly dead format, this outdated format, your format of choice? And I didn't really understand it until I started actually just buying records just because they were like my favorite album, something I'd listened to hundreds of times on CD. I'm like, well, I'll get that record. And then I, you know, played it on my turntable and uh, I was like, well, I'm hearing things differently. Whether it was like kind of reverb or like, you know, a cymbal crash or um, a certain, certain, yeah, on the string. Yeah, certain, yeah. certain nuances that just sounded different, sounded like it was more like it captured maybe what it sounded like in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, and that felt more real to me. And the fact that it wasn't embraced at the time made it even cooler to me that I was getting into something that wasn't what everyone else did. Mm -hmm. And then that made me feel kind of special about, you know, not just uh, listening, but then kind of collecting things, um, especially in the 90s where vinyl wasn't championed. It was, it was cheap. Um, it was readily available, right. and I'm like, well, if it's not for everyone, then it's for me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty jealous. I'm assuming that if you were collecting vinyl in the 90s, you probably got a hold of some records that are very rare now because they were so limited in press back then, and you would get them for cheap, and now they're impossible to find, like some of that early grunge stuff. And Yeah, I, you know, a lot of the indies kept vinyl alive through the 90s, and you saw major labels kind of coming to them as they saw the popularity of their artists, but they were always doing records, whether it was, you know, a seven inch singles club of the month uh, or just pressing LPs, um, that still lived on and you could get those cheaper, even though it's more expensive and it's always been more expensive to make records than CDs. In the 90s, they were actually cheaper, even new. Like if a CD was like $14.98, you know, you could still find the record for like $9.98. It's crazy. Uh, and I would order things that weren't even in stock. They were just in the database thinking like, well, if I can get this Smashing Pumpkins record or <laughs> this Pantera record, it's weird some of the things that I bought just by asking to have them ordered. Mm -hmm. And those records within like five or six years just shot up in value. Yeah. You just won't find them anymore. And the 90s presses themselves are some of the rarest because they're the least pressed domestically. If you found them, they might be promos or very limited or mostly import presses. Mm -hmm. So how many records would you say you own at home person? It fluctuates, but uh, I'm around 2,500 LPs wow. right now. Oh my God. But I, I've i owned more. Okay. I've, I've been Carrying down in recent years to things that seem essential versus uh, things that were more like collecting, and you know the whole catalogs from certain bands, from you know live records to 12 inches, kind of figuring out that you know if I want to listen to that artist, these might be like the two to four records I will listen to from them on vinyl, whereas everything's accessible to listen to, 
you know, what's what am I going to be going to anyway? Right. So don't need to have it all. It's funny. I'm I'm sitting around fifteen hundred, and it's it's amusing you said like the essential because I feel this this way where I'm trying to look at my collection and be like, all right, I need to downsize. I need to pick things that aren't essential. And I start going through my shelf and I'm like, wait, this, I, this is essential. This is also essential. And I have a yeah. reason for every record pretty much as to why I want to keep it. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, because I think that's the that's the draw to music. It, it accents your life and that's very personal and how it affects you and how you interpret uh, that art. Um, and I think that's what draws people to music. But then vinyl brings out that animal too where you're just like, well, it feels like you're a part of it by yeah. owning something that wasn't necessarily mass manufactured, something that takes more time in terms of, you know, having to press a record and having to master it for a record and cut that lacquer. I think I just embraced that side of it more. But as your tastes change too, as you get older, I think certain things that you have, you're like, well, I don't play that anymore because I'm not that into it anymore. And there's the nostalgia. But then it's like, well, I'm kind of more about this now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sitting on this as much because I can just trade that in and get what I'm about now. Are there any Holy Grail records that you've always wanted to have but you just never found? There are, and after about 20 years now working in record stores, they're less and less because I actually do get to see those and find them. Um, but I, I'm a big Danzig fan. I still don't have Danzig 3, How the Gods Kill, which came out in like I think like 92 or maybe 93. Do you know how limited it is? Do you have like... The uh, there's there's a bunch of different import presses that I have like on my want list uh -huh. on Discogs because I'm one of those guys too. Oh yeah. Um, too. But you know, you usually find them for like 100 to 150 bucks. And the way my job is, is just, you know, I'll, I'll eventually see it. Um, and of course, the day I buy it online is probably the day I'll see it come through the store. <laughs> right, it just, that's just how it happened. You're like, yeah. no! So who are some of your favorite artists, just overall? Well, I, I am uh, a big metal guy. Okay. Uh, metal, experimental, and electronic music. Definitely metal is pretty close to my heart. Uh, I would say uh, bands like uh, Danzig, Misfits, Sepultura, Typo Negative, Neurosis. Um, those, are, those are some of my very favorite bands. Do you um, like some of the more like folk metal stuff, like Agaloc? Because that's the metal that I like. I like some of the more like like it cross genre stuff. Oh, definitely. And I think as time goes on, you know, having just like some pure genre doesn't seem to fit in terms of being an original band. So kind of progressing into what is your own style, which could be a melding of you know, a band like Agaloc. I think it comes from a black metal, but also kind of like a post-metal, post-rock perspective, mm -hmm. and then maybe kind of the more acoustic or quiet elements that can be perceived as like kind of more folk mm -hmm. as well. So you worked at Rasputin. Yes. Was there anything between Rasputin and Amoeba? No, I uh, left Rasputin in 2002 and moved back to LA, where I was from originally, to work at the new Hollywood store. Mm -hmm. This is a great company to work for, and they offered me positions uh, at the stores up north or to come down to the new shop that just opened. So I, I came here about six months after it opened and worked here for nearly seven years and left in January of 2009 to start my own record store. Oh wow. Uh, where it wasn't actually my store because I wasn't an owner, but uh, it, uh, it was called Vacation Vinyl. It still exists. Oh, and in, over in Silver Lake. In Silver Lake yeah. in the Sunset Junction. It originally opened up, the location was on Hollywood, like Hollywood in Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, near Waco, Soap Factory. Did that for about four years. Things kind of fell apart with the ownership uh, in one of the labels or the label that kind of backed us. Um, so one of the owners pulled out and I was asked to leave. But luckily enough, my family at Amoeba, I think, Two days later, I was back here working. That's awesome. And yeah, you guys all seem like, like, I come here all the time. This is my favorite store, and I feel like everyone does seem like a family here. Everyone's like very friendly with each other, and there's a good kind of chemistry between all the all the employees. And that's that's great for a record store. It's not just people, you know, going to the register and doing their thing. It's like it feels like if you ask a question, like everyone's kind of involved, and it's very uh, community. Yeah, I think that's important about a record store. Um, is that kind of like sharing and that, that camaraderie. Um, you learn more and uh, you get turned on to more stuff that way.
kind of have to have a path, otherwise you get lost in here and then you'll never find what you're looking for. Yeah. This is awesome. This is such a cool room. This is where they. This is where the artists before they go on stage. This is where they're yeah. Hanging. Yeah, because you can come out right through here to the back into the jazz room, and there's a separate you know, stage entrance in the back. So, what record do you get most excited to see come in whenever it comes in? Do you have like one or two that you're like, yeah? Not really. Uh, I think within like the bands that I listed are some of my favorites. When I just see those come in, I get excited. Like that might just go upstairs with me and get a spin before it hits the floor mm -hmm. kind of deal. Just because you don't it's see a cool it all the time. That's, or... that's awesome to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I yeah, it's fun. I, I'll just grab a handful of records on a day where I'm working because I am going to price them, but then, you know, yeah. You got to have well, a soundtrack while you're pricing, right? Ex exactly. That's <laughs> a, that kind of thing. Do you, do you think there's like some of them, like what are some of the most common records that you see coming in that like constantly, like obviously like you would assume it's like Linda Ronstadt and stuff like that. But like, yeah, you do see a lot of Linda Ronstadt. <laughs> and, you know, certain vocalists like Barbra Streisand or even older stuff like, uh, you know, Johnny Mathis or Nat King Cole or Frank Sinatra and then kind of hokey stuff like Andy Williams. And then things that were kind of just a sign of the times like the JF JFK speeches. Um, you see that fairly frequently? Yeah. Huh. Uh, First Family Rides Again, that comedy record, you just know it by that cover. That's changed over the years too. Uh, in the 90s, it was always Carol King Tapestry. Yeah, was that um, one of the most pressed records of all time or something? I, I'm not sure it could be, because I would see it all the time, and the funny thing was that record used to be so common you never paid for it, and now an original owed 70 press, uh, I think it's like a $20 record, you know? that's tells you what's happened between late 90s to now. My, my friend once said a funny thing. He said uh, that everybody owns a copy of Tapestry whether they realize it or not. Like yeah. it's just somewhere in your house or just like it just they just appear. It's, yeah. it's one of those <laughs> records that you see at every thrift store and I mean it's a great album. It's one of the one of the best singer-songwriter albums I yeah. think of all time. But are there any bands or records that you, people might think come in frequently that you barely ever see? That they think come in all the time. Yeah, something that people are like this must be, you must see this all the time. They like actually this never really comes comes through. I don't get that so much anymore. Um, what people think sometimes people think the other way, like oh I have Beatles records or Stones records or Zeppelin records, and you you know these are worth a lot or you don't see it. It's like no, they're Beatles, Rolling Stones, and right. Zeppelin. They were like, pressed so many, so yeah. many times, and yeah, they'll have value depending on you know what pressing you have and, and nuances of different pressings, domestic and import. But uh, you know, it's it's not like you're on a gold line necessarily. Right? Do you have people frequently come in and kind of insist that some of their common records are like very rare, and then they get all indignant? All the time, you know. <laughs> It can be annoying. I think the, the best way to be a buyer is just communicating with people and being able to work with people. Um, and you kind of learn together. Some people have something awesome and rare and they know it and other people don't. And then other people think like, yeah, this is super rare. And you're like, you know, it's not. This is just a later, you know, 70s Capital Beatles press. It's mm -hmm. not an original with uh, Capital Rainbow. It's not, you know, a, a Parlophone EMI press, you know. Uh, so it's it's not that rare. Actually, they kept pressing it, and this is just a later press. And they're like, oh, okay. So most people are kind of like, they understand, they like respect your opinion. I, I feel well, like some yeah. people would be arrogant and just be like, you're wrong, I know my stuff. Some, like, some people do, but that's they're a little bit naive. Uh, I think some people look at websites like eBay or Amazon or Discogs, and they, they might see what people are asking for a record, and they perceive that as the value of the record. Sure. And that's not true. They're not actually seeing like completed auctions on eBay, and they don't understand that maybe they're not even you know, possessing that actual pressing that's being 
sold, so sometimes you have to break it down for people, but they're adamant that this is worth that much, and they'll pull out their phones now that everyone has internet in their hands. Like, look, look at or, this. Or, you know, people often, which is annoying, uh, you know, they'll have notes on all their stuff, like, of what they think the value is. Uh -huh. And the reality is, is if you're running a business, you're not paying someone what it's worth. You're paying what someone you a percentage of what it's worth so we can sell it and right. make money and I can get paid and we can mm -hmm. keep the lights on. And right, exactly. You're stuff. also helping your record store, you know, by, by turning it in. It's not just a completely one-way trade between you and a person. It's like it's like affecting a business that you hopefully love and that you want to support. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned the whole eBay thing because I've said to someone before, it's like someone's like, well, this record must be worth a lot. And I was like, I could put a copy of Abbey Road from 75 on eBay for $9,000. That does not mean it's worth $9,000 just because I wrote that number and put it up for sale. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of actually rare records, I'd love to hear about some of the rarest things that you've seen come in here that maybe people didn't realize or that you were like, oh my God, I can't believe this is here. Well, it's usually like a weird nuance of a press um, or something that was pulled or banned or something like that. You know, the, the always talked about record would be a Beatles butcher cover sure in, in the different stages that you can see a butcher cover in um, and then varies between a stereo and mono press have you seen those like an original like with the sticker on it still? yeah and yeah. Like, people don't even know I, I see them more now than I used to you know 15 20 years ago so it varies it, it doesn't seem that special to me anymore when I see a butcher cover I think one of the rarest things that I personally saw come over the counter was a David Bowie Diamond Dogs press gatefold where the dog still had the penis on it which, oh, wow. which yeah, was yeah. removed i think it also might have been like a uh, also a promo white label um and this is years ago and i think that was thousands and thousands of dollars you know probably around 2005 or six one of the most expensive records i've seen on on the back wall here was actually a uh, picture disc of eddie vedder into the wild i think you guys are selling yeah. for like a thousand or something i've never even seen it before yeah, there's a regular, you know, regular vinyl press of that as well from the label Vinyl Films mm -hmm. that put that out, Cameron Crowe's yep. label. Um, and a lot of the stuff that Vinyl Films does is a limited press, like the Herald and Mod soundtrack, uh, which wasn't, you know, the Cat Stevens record, which wasn't really complete press until that one came out. That kind of drives a price mm -hmm. in a certain direction when just the demand is so much greater than how many are available. So this year, Vinyl is on track to being a billion dollar industry for the first time since the 70s. Do you think as like a vinyl, someone who's like in, in the world of buying and selling vinyl and stuff, do you think the vinyl bubble is going to pop soon or do you think that we are still, we have a, it's going up from here? You know, I, I, I was thinking it would pop, like it just couldn't sustain like this, but at this point, I don't know. Uh, more people, younger people continue to get into it, buying turntables, the number of turntables we're selling. Uh, the number of records we're selling and the way prices continue to rise and then in some ways plateau for, for certain things, but when you see new presses of records, things that just came out, new artists, it's six months later, the pink marble vinyl being 50 or $60, right. and you're like, well, you, you don't always see something like that coming, you yeah. know, or even a reissue of something being more valuable than the original, mm -hmm. and you're like, well, I don't know, like, yeah, I, I would like to know the source material of how this was mastered or possibly remastered. Um, because if you're into vinyl, you hopefully want the, the sound first and foremost and not just the collectability of sure. it. I think the collectability of it has, has taken charge in some senses. And, uh, you know, there's a fad, there's a popularity, like kind of a hipness, a trendiness to records right now, I think. Some people buy them and they get into it and it's like, well, my friends all like this, but the reality is I don't play this in my car and I have a turntable, but I don't have a good receiver, I don't have good speakers. So I'm not really optimizing this format that's kind of more of a hassle for me. And then they fall out of it and you see a lot of people like all in the same day, just here's the 30 records I bought that now I don't really care about. And right. Hope they'll sell them back. I feel like in terms of the vinyl bubble, it's, not something I see popping, but I'm worried with how the trend is going because I see dollar signs in the eyes of all the labels and, you know, all the prices of double LP since I started collecting have skyrocketed. I'm seeing LPs come out $30, $40 out the gate for just like a standard, not limited run press. 
And that's, it seems like it's going up steadily since I started collecting. It is. Um, that's kind of, it's just, it's sad. Also, the, you know, the demand, the number of plants that exist in the U.S. So the backlog, the wait time to get something pressed is longer than I've ever seen. And I play in bands and press records and, you know, we're having to wait six or eight months at some places to even get your record pressed because the majors are just flooding the market with somewhat unnecessary reissues um, and then trying to kind of take charge of that and maybe kind of knock the little guy out of the game a little bit, the indies that actually kept that format alive for so many years. Um, it, that That's difficult. That's hard to take. So the price is getting driven up mostly because of the demand, but it is a pricey format. It's easier to ship CDs. They don't weigh as much. You know, oil in some ways has been getting cheaper, but in terms of shipping things, that it's expensive. So it's not ideal in terms of like physical product. Other than that, you know, people who love it and embrace it and want to work in a store like this uh, really enjoy uh, other people who also embrace it. We have Record Store Day coming up. I don't know if you're excited about anything on the list. Is there anything you're planning on picking up? Yeah, geez, I already wrote down the things I want. I kind of forgot what I wrote <laughs> down. I actually think I'm getting some kind of hokey stuff. Like I think there's a Corey Feldman like there is. picture there is seven the, inch. Yeah. And my wife just loves that stuff. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a train wreck, but it's, you know. It's a major novelty for sure. <laughs> That's not gonna go on the turntable um, too often. I can't remember, there, there was like one or two other things uh, and now I can actually can't recall. <laughs> but you, you're planning on coming and getting some stuff. Oh yeah, I will be here bright and early. Uh, I'll probably just be ringing people up for like the first four hours or so because uh, we set up extra registers at the buy counter on top of like the, you know, 16, 18 other registers that we normally have just to facilitate the special presses that come out that day. Mm -hmm. You know, the line that we have around the block all the way you know, down to Ivar, people camping out overnight. I think some years it varies and stuff that I'm more interested in, stuff that I'm, um, you know, not. Um, like I said, there's a few things this year, but it'll be odd because I'm ringing people up and I'll see it and, and I'll be like, like, oh, I want that. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any other crazy stories about Amoeba? Anything that people should know who are watching that want to know things about the best record store in the world? So I think working at a place like Amoeba is great because of the people, because of the staff, the relationships you make with people always learning every day, kind of growing your knowledge about music. If you're a record guy, about record presses and weird things like that. But working for a company that actually gives back, a company that takes care of their employees, uh, I think that's probably rare. I know for other record stores I've worked at, it, it, it's rare, you know, having a company, you know, offer health insurance, uh, dental insurance, things like that, vacation. That, that doesn't exist at all record stores and certainly doesn't for a company that gets so involved in charitable works and uh, giving back to the community. That's what makes this store a little bit more special, I think, and why it's it's lasted this long. Well, this was great. I learned a lot. This is, I mean, you have the dream job. I'm definitely <laughs> jealous. And uh, yeah, so long live records and long live Amoeba. I mean, do you know anything? Are we allowed to talk about this whole Amoeba lease thing? You know? Sure, I, I think it, it's, it's really public knowledge and I think there's been a lot of misinformation out there that's been frustrating for the staff. Yeah, Amoeba has sold the building um, and in fact what people don't know is the building had been sold before mm -hmm. and then purchased a piece of land like this in Hollywood has obviously gone up in value and you see all the construction around. But Amoeba has a lease right now. I think the possibility of moving exists. Um, but at this point, I think we have we have a few years, two, three years or so on that lease. Um, and we're not closing. Good. Um, if, if it's the worst case scenario, yeah, Amoeba might be in another location, which is sad because Amoeba kind of made this area mm -hmm. what it is now. It's um, the centerpiece of Hollywood, in my opinion. There wasn't much construction, there wasn't much uh, happening around here until Amoeba made this like the center for people to come to. And I know people don't want that to go away, but you know, some things are out of your control. Um, so at worst, yeah, you might see us pop up in another, uh, another location. Thank you again, Pete. This was yeah, awesome. Totally, and man. Had fun. Th yeah, thank you to Amoeba for letting us do this. Uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe, and we'll have more videos for you every week. Every month, I get a lot of records in, and the thing I look forward to every month especially is feed bands. In this video, I'm going to share all my thoughts on the last feed bands artist I received. In